not, not my intentions to be very long, but it is my intention to do what thus saith the Lord today and to give you the truth that God has given the minister. And so what those things said, I want you to open your Bibles if you would, uh, beginning in Matthew, the 16th chapter, and I want to read uh, verses 13 through 19, and very quickly we're going to skip to Ephesians chapter 2 and read verses 19 through 21. So we're going to begin in Matthew 16, verse number some Elias and others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, by Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now if you would turn very quickly to Ephesians chapter 2. We want to read verses 19 through 21. And the scripture reads, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together unto an holy temple in the Lord. We'll give you our topic in a moment, but now if you'll bow your heads with me, Father, I thank you now for this another opportunity to minister your word. We thank you for the people of God. We don't take it for granted that we're able to be here, to stand and to proclaim your word. We thank you, Lord, that we were not hindered by the things that the enemy has tried to do, but we made it here safely. And Father, we thank you for those who are here and those who desire to be here but could not today. But now, Lord, we ask that you would bless your word, that you would allow it to go out and not return void. We'll give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Last week I spoke to you from the topic, Don't Stop Building Unto God. And in this message today we focus in the message we spoke last week, we focused upon the teaching of Jesus to his disciples and in Matthew 7, where Jesus used a parable of a wise man who built his house upon rock versus a foolish man who built his house upon the sand to emphasize to his disciples how important it was for them to be sure that they established their faith upon a firm foundation. And of course, in this parable, Jesus conveyed that the house of the wise man was able to stand when the rain, winds, and floods of life came. But that the house of the foolish man did not stand because it was built upon sand. So today I want to further speak to you about establishing a firm foundation when it comes to our faith. And I want to use for a topic, building upon a winning confession. Building upon a winning confession because 
I want you to understand today that God himself desires to build upon your confession. With that, I want to begin today's message by focusing, focusing upon the 13th through the 19th verses of the 16th chapter of Matthew that we've read today. For in this chapter, the scripture highlights an intimate and significant moment between Jesus and his disciples where Jesus reveals several truths to them that are important for them to understand as followers of Jesus Christ. So therefore, I want you to pay very close attention to this, this exchange between Jesus and his disciples, beginning with the 13th verse in Matthew 16. This text begins by conveying that Jesus had just come into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And the very first thing that the scripture records in this exchange between Jesus and the disciples is that Jesus asked two very simple but significant questions of his disciples. And not only were they very significant to the disciples, but what I want you to understand today, that these questions are also very significant in the life of every believer today. And so the first question that Jesus asked his disciples was, whom do men say that I am, the son of man? Whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And after Jesus asked this question, his disciples answered, Some say thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. But then Jesus follows up with a second question and says to them, But whom do ye say that I am? You see, when Jesus asked the first question, whom do men say that I am? I want you to understand that the word men is a reference to those in the world who did not really know Jesus. But when Jesus asked this second question of his disciples, he was speaking to those whom he had actually spent some time with, who should know him for themselves, and whom he would later, later give the great Commission to in Matthew 28. In other words, these are men Jesus would eventually use to establish the church. So when Jesus asked these questions of his disciples, it serves as an indication to us as believers that he does not expect our thinking to be influenced by the thinking of the world but that we should be confident in our own personal convictions about who Jesus is to us. You see, Jesus asking these questions of the disciples is very important and fundamental to our faith as believers. Because we all know that there are a lot of people in the world who don't really know for themselves who Jesus is. But yet, they often have their own personal opinions about who he is. So one of the primary things that Jesus was trying to get across to his disciples in this particular exchange was that it was important that they know who he was for themselves. He was conveying to them that I now know what other men say, but what I want to know now is what do you say? And we can relate to this because, you know, there are those sometimes who try to give their own opinions about you, but don't know you. Sometimes have never been in your presence, but yet they have an opinion about who you are. And so Jesus wants these disciples to, to tell him, who do you say that I am? See, there are some people 
whose conversations change. When they get around people who don't agree with their theology and who have a wrong perspective of who Jesus is. And because of this, sometimes those who are supposed to be in relationship with Jesus are afraid to speak with conviction about who they believe Jesus to be and who he really is to them. When they are in the presence of other people who don't believe like they believe. But we should be aware that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 verse 33 that whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my father which is in heaven. So in other words, this should be a clear message to those of us who are followers of Christ. That we should never be afraid to let our trust and our hope that we have in Christ be known. Especially in the presence of non-believers. Because all of us want to hear him say, well done, one day when we stand face to face with God. And so with that said, after the second question, Peter answers in Matthew 16 and 16 and says to Jesus, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter's response to Jesus was really a key moment in this exchange between Jesus and the disciples because after Peter's response to Jesus, Jesus uses his response as an opportunity to reveal several truths unto Peter as well as the rest of the disciples and ultimately to us. There are some things that he wants us to know even in the answer that he would give to Peter. And so what I want to do during this message today is to examine these truths that Jesus reveals to the disciples because all of them are relevant to us as Christians today. So to begin, the first truth that Jesus reveals to the disciples is found in verse 17 of Matthew 16. Because the first thing that Jesus says to Peter after Peter's response is blessed art thou. In other words, Jesus was saying to Peter, you are blessed because you know for yourself who I am. And let me just say this to you listen, listening to me today who really know Jesus for yourself and who are not ashamed to announce to the world that you know him. You are also blessed for that reason alone. Jesus is letting Peter know that he's blessed. It is because we understand for ourselves that Jesus is not some fairy tale, but that he is indeed the son of the living God. And Peter was able to say that in the presence of Jesus with conviction. I wonder, do we as the church have any conviction of who Jesus is today, given the state of the world, the state of many Christians in this hour, who seem to be on occasion changing their belief system. But the word of God has not changed. Now why is this important? It is important because at the end of the day, it's really not going to matter what other people say. This is why Jesus asked Peter, well, who do you? say that I am. That's why he asked the disciple, whom do you say that I am? You see, it's not going to matter what mother, father, sister, or brother, or even your enemy thinks about Jesus. But what's going to matter is that do you know him for yourself? That's what's going to matter. Now, the second truth that Jesus gives to Peter and the disciples, he says to them, flesh 
and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. In other words, when Jesus makes this statement to Peter, he was emphasizing to his disciples that through me, you have a connection with my Father in heaven. Is there anybody glad about your connection with the Father in heaven? Jesus said in John 14 and 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You see, we can't be connected to the Father if we're not con connected to Jesus. Tasha Cobbs even says it this way. She says, he knows my name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm glad Amen. that he knows my name. In other words, we must understand that we are not just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody that can save everybody. Amen. But we are somebody in the eyes of God. He knows your name. That's enough to give him some praise about. But you know, we're somebody because he loves us. We're somebody because we are a child of the living king. Because we are children of God, we must also understand that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ According to Romans 8, verse 16 through 17. We're somebody because God knows our name. God knows who we are. God knows our purpose. He knows why he created us. Now the third truth. Jesus says to Peter, upon this rock. In other words, upon this confession, Peter, I will build my church. Now, I want you to notice in the text that Jesus did not say, Peter, upon you, I'm going to build my church. That's not what Jesus was saying. He was not saying that he was going to build his church upon Peter. But he said, upon this rock, upon this foundation, upon this confession. I'm going to build my church. You see, we must understand that when Jesus said to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church, he was not saying once again that he was going to build his church upon Peter. But when Jesus said this to Peter, he was referring to Peter's confession of who Jesus is. In other words, Jesus was saying to Peter that upon your confession of faith, I'll build my church. Uh, upon your confession, I'm going to build my church. We must understand that Jesus was not just talking about Peter's confession alone. But he was also talking about your confession and my confession of faith. So one of the very important things that we must see in this exchange between Jesus and Peter is that our confession of who Jesus is is of necessity in the building that God wants to do through us. I want you to understand that God wants to build through us, but we must have a confession of who he is. In other words, before Jesus can begin the process of building his church, there must be a confession by the church of who he is. We cannot be ashamed, but we must have conviction as Peter did to know that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. But you see, more than confessing who Jesus is, we must be able to confess who Jesus is to us. Because that is what matters. You see, the devils know who he is. But who is he to you? That is the real question. When it comes to Jesus continuing to build the church through you, can he depend upon your confession as one of the building blocks of the faith to stand strong? Even the face of even in the face of others 
who don't believe who Jesus is. How many of you know some folk who don't believe who Jesus is? You've been around people uh, that who don't believe who he is. But you got to know who he is for yourself. Can you still confess him as Lord? But Jesus said in Matthew 10, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. I don't know about you, but I want Jesus to be so pleased with my life that he won't mind confessing me before his father. One day, we will need for him to confess us before his father. Amen. That he knows who we are. You see, our confession is important because our confession of who Jesus is, we must understand, establishes us in right standing with God. We must understand that it is our confession that marks the place in our lives where the old man steps back and the new man. You see, it is our confession that makes us accountable. It marks the place in our lives that gives God something to build upon. It's our confession where we set the stake in the ground. That I am now a child of the living king. And that it doesn't matter what devil is present, it doesn't matter what agnostic is present, it doesn't matter who is present, who don't believe like I believe. But I have established my stake in the sand that this day, upon my confession, I yes in our lives. This is why the Bible says in Romans 10 and 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The next truth that I want to share with you that Jesus gave to his disciples, this is the fourth truth in the 18th verse. He says, The gates of hell shall not prevail against you shall not prevail against the church and I love this verse because these are the words of Jesus himself Jesus says in the text that the gates of hell once again shall not prevail against the church Jesus did not say that the gates of hell might not prevail against the church but he said that the gates of hell, the very gates of hell, shall not prevail against the church. So what does this mean to the believer? It means that our foundation in Jesus is a winning foundation. We are standing on a winning foundation in Jesus. That regardless of what comes our goals, in our lives, as long as we stay hooked up with Jesus, we win. This is why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 14, Therefore, now thanks be unto God, which also causeth us to triumph in Christ. That means that our foundation is not a shaky and insecure foundation, like the foundation of those mentioned last week, who had, built, who had built their house upon sand. That is why the words of an old gospel song that we used to sing says, On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. You see, I know there have been a lot of things that have come against the church. But I can tell you that it doesn't matter who, it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter when, when it comes to God's church, because Jesus has already declared that we win. Anybody glad? Amen. That Jesus has declared that we win. 
I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. How about you? I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. This is why, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Do I have another witness out there? Amen. We'll make that declaration that as for you, as for your house, you are going to serve the Lord. Amen. Because it is at the name of Jesus that every knee has to bow and every tongue has to confess. It's at the name of Jesus. This is why we ought not to mind confession, confessing who he is in our lives. The next truth, and I'll be through here before you know it, but the next truth that Jesus gives to his disciples, he says to them, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, Jesus is saying to his disciple, because of your confession, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I will give you authority. I want to grant you access. In other words, you, you have a benefit of heaven while living on earth. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And because of your confession, I am going to give you everything that you need, but it begins with your confession. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Now, the next thing that Jesus says, he says, and whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed. In heaven. In other words, what Jesus was letting his disciples know right here is that with your keys, you have some authority. In other words, you will have the authority to speak a thing and cause heaven to come into agreement with what you say. But first of all, we've got to be sure that we are in agreement with heaven and not be afraid to confess with our mouth who Jesus is. In other words, Jesus is saying to the church that if we come into agreement with heaven, then whatsoever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Again, we've got authority. We've got access in heaven. Heaven knows who we are. God knows your name. And whatsoever we lose on earth, once again, shall be loose in heaven. You see, I believe that the only reason that there is still some stuff that is still attached to us is because we've not used our keys, we've not used our authority to loose it. We've not used our authority to bind it. We have authority to loose heal, healness in our lives as opposed to sickness. Because if we bind sickness and loose healing on earth, it shall be declared to be so in heaven. We have the authority as well to bind poverty and to lose financial freedom in our lives because if we bind poverty and lose financial freedom, it will be, it will be declared to be so in heaven. So we need to understand something very clearly as the Bible teaches us that is, hell cannot prevail over the victory that heaven has come into agreement with. Amen. Whatever heaven agrees with, whatever heaven says, whatever we say in heaven agrees with, it becomes so in our lives. The Bible says in 1 John 5 and 4, For whatsoever is born of God, watch this word, overcometh the world. And it says, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So again, I want you to understand that as believers, we are victorious in Christ. Because of our, and because of our confession, we give Jesus something to build upon in our life. 
Once again, I want to turn your attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and 14. Because the scripture says again, it says, Now thanks be unto God. Watch this. It says, which always, not sometimes, but the scripture says, which always causes us to triumph. How so? In Christ. He always causes us to triumph in Christ. This is the reason that you are not to be ashamed to confess who he is. Because the Bible lets us know that we always, he always causes us to triumph in Christ. So I need you to understand today that as a child of God, as a child of the King, you can't help but be victorious. You can't help but walk in victory. Sometimes because of circumstances in our lives, the enemy will try to convince us that we've lost or we will lose. But you need to understand that you cannot lose with God. Amen. And he wants to build upon your confession. He wants to build upon your faith. The enemy cannot do anything with you so long as you're standing on the solid rock. I want to stress again as we talked on last week, build on a firm foundation. Allow your faith to be built on the word of God. Amen. These days people are challenging the word. They're challenging who Jesus is. People want to change what God's word says. This is the reason that our confession is so very important. There are people who will even to, in this day and time say that they are Jesus themselves. Sometimes we'll put them on the same level with Jesus. But no, Jesus, the Jesus that we serve, he is the son of the living God, even as Peter says in the text. Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That is who we serve, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And we cannot lose because we are on the Lord's side. How many of you will lift your hands today and say, God, I thank you that I'm on your side. I thank you that I'm a child of the living king. And then these are the things that I wanted to stress to you today. Amen. That there are some truths. There, there is a firm foundation that we're standing on when we're standing in Christ. And we have to stand when those around us are not willing to do so. Can I get an amen? amen. We, we have to be willing to stand even when people don't believe our confession. Because once again, as I said earlier, it's not what people say. It's not what mama say, father say, sister or brother. But does Jesus know who you are. But if we don't confess him before men, he's already told us, he will not confess us before his father that's in heaven. And so I want to encourage you today to stand upon your confession, regardless of what will come against you, because I want you to understand that there will be things that will come against you. There will be people who will come against you. There will be times that you don't even feel that you're saved. But it's not about your feelings. It's about standing on the true and the living word of God. And so we, we thank you today. This is, this is the message that God has given me uh, to share with you today. Not one that is long, but one that gives you to know that standing on a firm foundation in Christ is so very important in our lives. And if we've never had to stand before, if we've never had to be bold before, this hour that we're living in now, we need to be bold for Christ. We need, we need to be willing to open our mouths and to confess who he is to us. Because you never know, there's somebody whom you could save 
through your confession of who he is. There's somebody watching your life whether you want them to or not. And so we have to be sure about the foundation that God has given us in Christ. So I thank God for that which he's given me to share with you today. And I know this may, and it is a simple message. It's a very simple message. Sometimes we need to be reminded that we still got to stay in this hour that we're living in. So we appreciate all that God has done in our lives. We want to pray today for those of you that are present, those that are listening by way of social media. Uh, there are those who are dealing with various issues. We want to pray for you today. People are dealing with, with problems, and sometimes uh, because of the problems that, we, that we're that we dealing with in our lives, sometimes we'll feel like our foundation is not very strong. Sometimes when you, you are dealing with problems in your life, that's when the enemy comes in like a flood. The Bible lets us know that God will lift up a standard against it. And so we, we must understand that even in our weakness, God's word is still strong. Even his strength is perfected in our weakness if we're willing to turn to him. So I want to pray for those of you that are listening today. And I want to pray about your circumstance. I want to pray about for those of you especially who don't know the Lord Jesus, who have not accepted him as your Lord, as your Savior, who cannot at this time have the confession that I'm talking about today. I want to pray for you because you need Jesus in your life. You may not believe it now, but you are going to know one day that you need Jesus. Because as I've said earlier, every knee is going to have to bow before him. Amen. And every tongue is going to have to confess. You may not confess him now, but one day you will have to confess him as Lord. As being the son of God, even as Peter did. So I'm going to pray for you. So I want you to bow your heads. Father, thank you now for this another time, another opportunity to share your word. We thank you for the simplicity of your word. Lord, you want to build upon our confession. We thank you, Lord, even for the confession of Peter. We thank you, Lord God, more so for our own confession, that we can proclaim you as the Christ, the Son of the living God. He who have come to live on the inside of us. And so, Lord, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice. I pray, Lord, for their individual circumstances. And I thank you, Lord, that we are reminded in 2 Corinthians 2 and 14, Lord, that you always cause us to win in Christ. We, you always cause us to triumph, even sometimes when it feels like and looks like we're losing. In Christ, we win. So God, we thank you for that today. Again, Lord, touch those who are listening today, those who might listen to this broadcast at a later time. I pray even for them, for their various circumstances. That, for that one, Lord, who don't know you, I pray for them. Lord, that their heart will be touched to the extent that they would cry out, what must I do to be saved? And I thank you for it now. Bless, Lord, the word that has been spoken. I thank you that it has not gone out and returned void, but it has accomplished that which you sent it to do. We thank you for it. We give you praise for it now. In the precious and in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We love you. We praise you. And we do adore you. God bless you. Thank you. Amen.